everyone. And uh, welcome to this um, webinar, uh, which is organized by Audiovisual Translators Europe, AVTE. Um, I'm, my name is Jean-François Cornu. I'm represent, I co-represent ATA, the French National Association of Audiovisual Translators with AVTE. And this has been a collective um, work putting together this um, webinar today with my colleagues from Germany, Bettina Alt from AVU, uh, Amalie Foss from the FBO um, um, Federation, um, Union of Journalists, uh, which tra audiovisual translators are from in Denmark, and Amalie Foss is our current president. Uh, Linus Kolberg in Sweden uh, from the Media Textarma um, Association. Mirka Brezowska in Slovakia from SSPUL. Petra Matic and Sandra Mladenovic uh, from DHAP. And Susana Loreiru from ATAV in Portugal, who's been uh, overlooking the technical aspects of, of this all, among other things. Um, we are going to talk about, um, as you can see, the uh, author's rights applied to audiovisual translation. And we are extremely delighted to uh, welcome Natasha Mangal, who's the legal and policy advisor at CSAC. CSAC is the International Confeder Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers. So it's the Federation of Collective Management Organizations. Uh, which deal with our with our author's rights, basically. And we have we'll have a two part um, webinar and we'll start obviously with the first part, which is about understanding the basic concepts related to author's rights. Um, it is true that the notions of intellectual property and author's rights are well known in some countries, but less familiar to translators in other countries, not only in the EU, um, but throughout the world. And we sometimes wonder how to deal with these notions and how do they protect us? So over to you, Natasha. Thanks very much, Jean-Francois. And uh, thanks very much everyone joining us online today. Uh, I'm very happy to be representing CISAC and to be speaking uh, to you today on uh, author's rights. It's a very important topic, of course, for all of us here, and it's something that is constantly developing, especially in the age of AI. Uh, hopefully, by the end of this presentation, we will move uh, from very basic concepts in intellectual property law and copyright in general to speaking about more advanced topics regarding contracts and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so with that, um, thanks very much again for the introduction. I have a very brief agenda set up. I have two parts that we will be discussing today. And the first part is going to be breaking down intellectual property law and intellectual property rights at a very, very basic level. So if you are unaware of how property rights are managed, uh, what the rationales behind property rights are, then uh, this part will be for you. Part two involves more advanced topics, as I mentioned, in recognizing and enforcing the rights of audiovisual translators. So in this part, I will discuss specific contractual clauses that may be interesting and useful for you to understand and know if you come across any of these contracts uh, within, your, uh, within your practice, within your jobs. And I will also speak about some differences between US and uh, EU law in this, uh, in this part. So without further ado, um, let's get started. And uh, we will start from the very beginning. Uh, so what are the rationales for having a property rights system or an intellectual property rights system uh, in the world? So why property rights? Why do we have rights and property? I'll give you a very brief hypothetical to understand the meaning behind property rights. 
So imagine you're walking down the street and you find a coin on the ground and you pick it up. Someone behind you uh, tells you that's mine. What do you ask next? So in determining who owns this coin, what kind of questions would you ask this person who claims that the coin is theirs? Well, you can ask the stranger to prove their initial ownership of the coin. So you can ask them, for example, to, okay, if this is your coin, why don't you describe it for me? Why don't you show some other proof that you've owned this coin before I've picked it up? Or the stranger could be asked to describe the circumstances under which uh, they lost it. So did they drop it? Uh, did they find out that they lost it a few blocks away, et cetera? Did they abandon the coin? So you could say in your defense, well, stranger, I saw that you dropped this and you left it behind, and now I've decided to pick it up and claim it as my own. Or we can apply what's called a finder's rule. So this is a first in time, first in rights application of a property right. I found it first, so it's mine. I've seen it first, so it's mine. The design behind property rights is to ask which rules apply in which circumstances. And that is where the law comes into place. So property rights in the law define theoretical and legal ownership of resources and how they can be used. Property can be owned by individuals, businesses, and governments. And these rights define the benefits associated with the ownership of the property. So property laws in our uh, different legislations define the following terms. So they define concretely what the terms of ownership are. So instead of asking a question of whether or not my finding of a coin relates to an abandonment question or another type of way to determine how this coin has been owned, the law will define that more concretely for you. So which parties will be entitled to which rights, the duration of the rights, so how many years those rights may last, and the scope of the protection under this property, that is all defined by the law. Property rights also define terms of negotiation, licensing, divestment, and selling of property rights. So if you go to the law, you can understand well, in my apartment, I have these rights, but I don't have these other rights. Those other rights belong to my landlord rather than myself. Property laws also define conflict resolution. So if there are two overlapping claims for a piece of property, for example, the law is a helpful place to look to understand who would win in this type of conflict. And on the topic of resolving property conflicts, uh, there are many different ways to decide ownership. And these methods are defined differently depending on the property at stake, and also depending on the national legislation and the approach that each member state or country may take. Uh, so here are a few terms that uh, may be associated with uh, property rights and law. I won't go through all of them, uh, but some of them are uh, quite useful, which we will discuss a little bit further here. The, those are the last two. So the utilitarian or incentive theory of uh, producing intellectual property or this personhood theory or moral rights theory, uh, which I will also elaborate on, which has a very specific place in intellectual property rights. Uh, and this is uh, just kind of a summary. So our choice of rule reflects the outcomes we want to achieve and balances private and public interests to benefit society at large. So when we speak about intellectual property rights in today's discussion, we will always be talking about where should the balance be struck between individual private property rights and the rights of the public and the public at large to access or gain uh, distributions of creative content. 
Uh, so there are some external considerations that may uh, be important for resolving a potential conflict. Um, so they involve concepts of fairness and concepts of justice. So for example, if you get paid for a piece of property and you believe that the person who entered into the agreement with you underestimated or undervalued the work severely, then you could point to a law to show that you are entitled to equitable and reasonable remuneration. So the amount of money that would be uh, usually paid in circumstances in which you've negotiated the contract with, but in which the person who is contracting with you decided to give you a low offer, maybe even too low. So this is an example of a potential conflict of interest. So notions of fairness and, ju and justice also play a part in resolving conflicts of interest, not only in property rights, but also as we'll see in intellectual property rights. So property rights in general, these are considered a group of rights which are vested in the individual. So if I own property, I have a group of rights, not just one right uh, in the property that I own. And in legal terms, this is usually referred to as a bundle of sticks or a bundle of rights that you can have as a property owner. And when we're talking about real property, for example, or property that exists in the real world, we have different rights, which are part of our bundle of rights. That's the right to occupy the property, the right to exclude others, meaning that you can't trespass, you can't enter onto my property, the right to use and enjoy the property as you deem fits as the owner, the right to control another's use of the property, the rights to convey or to give the property away, et cetera. So these are rights that are vested in the individual property owner. And this group of rights is often referred to as a quote unquote bundle of sticks. Now, intellectual property rights work very similarly in that each owner of an intellectual property right has not just one right usually, but a group of rights that are vested together. And we'll see what this group of rights will look at, will look like in a few minutes. Uh, so intellectual property rights or IP is defined as creations of the mind, such as inventions, literary and artistic works, designs and symbols, names and images, which are used in commerce. IP is protected in law by patents, copyright and trademarks. For the purposes of this discussion, we will be focusing mostly on copyright law and intellectual property rights enable creators, inventors, brand owners, et cetera, to earn recognition and financial benefits from what they invent or what they create. So moving on more specifically to copyright law, what are the conditions for getting copyright in something? So I have an idea, I've written it down, but what are the conditions for me to claim copyright protection over what I've created? I've uh, simplified this a little bit, to make it uh, easier to understand. Um, so I've broken it down into three different elements, which you should be aware of to understand when something can be subject to copyright protection and when something cannot. So these three elements are essentially the following. The work must be original to a certain extent. It must be expressed, so it has to go outside of the idea and be put into the physical world. So either by writing it out, drawing it, saying it, and having it being recorded, etc. This expression term also goes with this third criteria, which is that it should be fixed. Being fixed means that it is within a tangible form, a form that is able to be accessed, comprehended uh, externally. So all three of these elements together would make something copyrightable. And I will explain uh, some more criteria of these elements uh, in the following slides. 
Now, these, uh, this definition of copyrightability is mostly taken from uh, Section 17 of the U.S. Copyright Code, but I uh, will assure you that these three qualities, these three characteristics, will make anything copyrightable uh, internationally. So on an international basis, these criteria also work. And the way in which uh, copyright protected material is defined according to US law is the following. And I think this is a very nice, simple sentence to keep in mind. Uh, copyright protection subsists in original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So let's speak a little bit more about this criteria of originality. So something is original in the sense that it is the intellectual creation of its author. And I have a little uh, children's drawing on this uh, slide to give an example. So according to copyright law, no skill needs to be involved in assessing whether or not something is original or not. As long as it is something that is original to its author, original to its creator, then it passes the threshold for originality. Now, you might say, well, that's quite a low threshold. If a child can claim copyright protection over a drawing like this, how, uh, how interesting would it be for me as a creator to have copyright protection in something? Can I just draw a line on a piece of paper and that's copyright protected? Well, it's a low threshold, but it's for a reason. If we had a high threshold of copyright protection, that might mean that only works of high art or um, works of renown would get protected. That means that many people who are capable of creating something may not meet this threshold and therefore may not be able to benefit from copyright protection and all the rights that might be associated with their copyright protected work. This also may be an enemy for innovation. We don't want people to consider that every time they want copyright to be vested in work, it must be something that is very highly protected and of a very high standard and a very high level. We want to encourage innovation and by creating a very low threshold for originality, we allow more people to understand that if I want to innovate, I can benefit from copyright protection, even if I don't think that this might be as original. We set up a low threshold in order for more works to be qualified as copyright protected rather than fewer. Finally, works don't need to pass this test of imaginativeness or inventiveness or newness as in patents. So for qualifying for patent protection in intellectual property law, we must prove that this uh, patent does not exist and it is different from any existing prior art. So any existing prior invention, creation, etc. We don't need to provide the same proof for showing that a piece of copyright protected work is original. As long as it's original to the author, the author has created it on their own, they fix it in a tangible medium of expression, then it can be subject to copyright protection. This also makes copyright protection a very broad uh, protection that you can benefit from, but it does have its uh, limitations and we'll speak about that in a few minutes. So once we've determined that it's past this very low threshold of originality, now we have to consider whether or not the work has been expressed. And this is a very simple concept. It just means that the idea that you have in your head has been put into the physical world through some means. So the idea itself is not protectable under copyright, but the moment that you put the pen to paper, the moment that you create something, that is the moment in which the work is fixed. So the idea is realized in real life. So it's not necessarily something that needs to be made public. So you don't have to publish it or make it publicly available for you to 
prove that the idea has been expressed. You can just provide that it has been written down, that it has been recorded, et cetera, to show that is it's sufficiently expressed. And forms of expression and mediums of expression can also vary. So I can sing a song and have it recorded. I could uh, write a book. I could paint a picture. All of these are different methods of expressing an idea, but they are all valid methods. Finally, the idea, idea of it being expressed is that the work sufficiently must be sufficiently permanent or stable enough to permit it to be received, reproduced, or otherwise communicated in a period of more than a transitory duration. This last phrase, more than a period of transitory duration, this was added into copyright law because of the digital revolution and because of the transmissions of broadcasts. So as long as the work can be perceived for uh, an amount of time in which it can be um, understood or realized, then the work is sufficiently fixed. So to summarize uh, very well, uh, very easily, what we've described, if it's original, if it's expressed, and if it's fixed, what's protected and what's not protected here. So textual material, artistic work, works, dramatic works, musical works, these are all examples of subject matter which is protectable under copyright law. What's not protected? So just the idea or concept or a basic name or title, these would not be protectable under uh, intellectual property law or copyright law. However, sometimes there could be an exception. So if you have an idea which is sufficiently novel and new and you apply for a patent, that idea then can benefit from patent protection. But it is a very high threshold for obtaining a patent protection versus obtaining protection under copyright law. So yeah. now we'll move very quickly into copyright theory. So how do we perceive the role of copyright in relation to the creation of works of authorship? So there are two different sides to the debate for understanding the role of copyright law in society. So when copyright laws became available in the world, it was during a time where we had the introduction of the printing press and we had the introduction of ways to make many copies of different works and to circulate those different works. The incentive theory of copyright law mostly refers to the legal traditions that are based in the US and in uh, common law countries such as the UK. And this incentive theory is the following. So I will grant you a very limited specific control over your creative works in order to give you an incentive to share. So if someone is a painter, for example, and they paint, uh, they have a painting, and they have many paintings in their studio, what might incentivize this painter to sell their work? Well, if the painter still had the rights in that work in order to sell it, they had a commercial rights to sell their work, then if they uh, can prove this commercial right to sell their work, they can transfer that property to someone else and then obtain the revenues from it. Remember that intellectual property rights create a property right in something uh, that is the product of one's mind. So the role of intellectual property rights and copyright in society is to create a way in which artists, creators, inventors, etc., can earn or make a living from the exchange of this type, this unique type of property on the marketplace. So in a way, intellectual property rights create a market uh, for you to be able to then exchange it for value. Under this incentive theory of copyright law, uh, artists 
will ideally be able to secure a fair return for their creative labor by acknowledging that they have a property right in this creative labor that they've produced. And with this incentive, the idea or the theory is that this incentive may stimulate artistic creativity and it will benefit the public good. So if artists are incentivized by the possibility that they can benefit uh, financially from works that they produce and they sell, the idea is that this will give them enough opportunity for them to continue to release works. Uh, and then the more works that are received by the public, the better. A richer creative society is more important to achieve as a society. So this is something that the incentive theory works to provide. Um, and this is how the balance is struck. This is different than the author's right tradition, which considers the following. So creations, according to author's right systems, are a part of the author's self and a reflection of their identity. So in an author's right system, it's considered that the things that I create and the things that I produce are actually a reflection of myself and they're a part of myself and my identity so that I should maintain a connection to these works that I create as they circulate throughout the marketplace. According to an author's rights tradition, authors have specific rights in their creations that only they can exercise. And these are known as moral rights. So for example, uh, moral rights, and I'll give some uh, other examples as well. Uh, moral rights uh, cannot be exchanged uh, for value. So moral rights can only be vested in the original creator according to an author's rights system. Moral rights include rights such as the right to prevent someone from distorting your work or the right to prevent them from showing your work in a context in which you oppose to. So going back to the idea of exclusive rights and the idea of a bundle of rights, in intellectual property law, creators gain this set of exclusive rights the sticks of a bundle that are both economic and moral in nature. Economic rights include the following, right of reproduction, the right of communication to the public, the right of distribution, and the right to prepare derivative works. These first few are the most uh, utilized and the most uh, discussed uh, as far as in economic rights that are vested but there may also be other economic rights that are vested in the work. Moral rights, as I started to explain, are part of droit de auteur systems. Droit de auteur is the uh, right of the art artist or uh, author right. And this is a terminology that emerged from France. And the idea was that the connection of the work to the personhood of the author should be recognized and it should be respected by law. Uh, so this slide, uh, it is in French, but I think it's uh, quite illustrative. There are different rights that are associated uh, with moral rights and patrimonial rights. And I'll explain a few that are here. Uh, for example, patrimonial rights or droit patrimonial, uh, include the right of uh, representation, so where you can display the work, uh, the right of diffusion, so circulating the work, the right of adapting that work. This is also considered a patrimonial right. Um, and we have the moral rights, as I discussed before. Respect of the work means not to destroy or deface the work. Um, the right to uh, take back the work. So if you don't want it publicly displayed anymore, that could be an exercise of a moral right and uh, the rights to be seen. So the rights to display the work in the, the way in which you want it to be displayed, to hear the work in the context in which you would want it to be heard. Uh, these all encompass moral rights. Uh, Natasha, if yes. I may. Yes. Um, 
because uh, quite a lot of our a lot of our colleagues are working sometimes from American companies or through intermediary intermediaries or as end clients. Um, mm -hmm. We can see that there are differences from what you just uh, presented, uh, legal differences between US law and EU law. Um, and there are international treaties as well. So how do we how do we deal with all this when we have to defend our rights? For example, I'm working in Europe, and if I'm told by a company that only US legislation applies, how does it all work? Uh, sure. So thanks very much uh, for the question. If uh, you have an agreement uh, that is split between uh, services that are between two different jurisdictions, Usually in the agreement, and this should be also negotiated and discussed uh, to your benefit, which jurisdiction applies, which uh, applicable law is uh, presiding over that agreement. So this can be selected uh, ahead of time. Uh, these are uh, contractual provisions that can be included. Uh, in the absence of a contract, however, this becomes very difficult to negotiate after the fact. So if you are uh, negotiating with a party that is in the US and uh, you are based in Europe, some moral rights may still be vested in the work that you produce, but this depends uh, very much on the uh, scope of the access of the uh, final work. So if the scope of the access of the final work also includes Europe, for example, the moral rights can be recognized in Europe, but not necessarily the same case in the US. That's why it's quite important uh, ahead of time to have a discussion on which law might apply and also to negotiate in times of conflict, which law might apply. Um, especially if there is this cross-border issue. Okay. Jo no ho sé, tia, clar, per sa moni moni, i perquè queda tan una queta, no hauria de ser un... Oh, sorry. Some, some... I think someone was translating. Someone's mic could be switched off. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so I do have a few more slides before we will go into uh, the questions, but I'll go through this very, very quickly. Um, so if I'm working in the EU, I wanted to explain that there are three different levels of EU copyright law. There is the international law level uh, where I will discuss the Berne Convention, the EU law level, which are at the levels of EU directives and EU regulations. And then we have the level of national law. So for international law, we have uh, several international treaties. Uh, for our purposes, we'll focus on the Berne Convention, which is an international treaty that has many international signatories. So you can see a map here of all of the international signatories that are party to this Berne Convention. And uh, WIPO administers this uh, convention. And the purpose of WIPO, you've probably heard of this organization already, its purpose is to promote the protection of intellectual property worldwide and also to ensure administrative cooperation among IP unions established by the treaties and, for example, this Berne Convention. What is the impact of the Berne Convention on copyrights? Uh, I will describe these two main impacts. The first is the principle of national treatment. So courts of a country will apply their national law to acts that occur within that country. So we don't force judges to apply a foreign law in that jurisdiction. So if I were to have litigation in the US, US law would already apply. So selecting which jurisdiction's law may apply beforehand will already indicate to you which law will apply in case of a conflict. There is also the principle of automatic protection. So when a work is uh, granted protection under copyright law, no national law can provide for additional, um, 
additional means for you to obtain copyright protection. Once you've fixed that expression in a tangible medium that is sufficiently original, then automatically you have copyright protection in that work. So you don't have to register the work. This is voluntary. And in the US, there is a voluntary system of registering works, but you can still have copyrights protection and recognize copyright within your work without necessarily you registering the work. Uh, this goes into this concept of no formalities. So in order to recognize that I have a copyright in the work, it's not necessary for me to register the work or to write my name or have the copyright symbol. This used to be the case a long time ago, uh, but the copyright symbol is mainly now used as on notice that if you are to use my work, you should be sure that I will enforce my rights. And this is what the copyright symbol means if you attach it to any uh, works that you see. Um, this is the uh, three-step test. So if you hear this terminology, three-step test, it refers to the Berne Convention. And the Berne Convention mandates that any exceptions to a copyright owner's protection can only be permitted in certain special cases. They should also not conflict with the normal exploitation of the work, so a normal access of the work, for example. And this should not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the author. This may sound quite complex, but essentially what it means is that the copyright owner's protection in their work, so imagine an artist's protection in the painting that they've painted, is very strong. And for someone from the general public to use this work without permission, it must be under very specific circumstances. And these very specific circumstances are defined differently in each national law. And in the US, these exceptions are widely referred to as an exception of fair use. And I'll speak about that as well. Uh, and this is another. Uh, example just to explain more what this very uh, complex three-step test might mean. Uh, we'll move on to EU law, and I think it's important to kind of continue here. I do have quite a few more slides, so I'll try to be uh, rapid. Um, so EU law is considered an acquis communitaire, so a collective uh, a collection of different rules of copyright law. There is no single EU copyright title or copyright protection, but it is a community collection of different national laws regarding copyright. This doesn't mean that there aren't uh, significant similarities between all of the national laws. At a baseline, all national laws in the EU are considered harmonized to a certain extent, meaning that one can expect very similar recognition of rights between each member state. Now, there are many different legal instruments uh, to consider in EU copyright law. There are horizontal and vertical harmonization measures. Vertical measures, meaning that it's very subject specific. So here's a number of different directives that are subject matter specific. So uh, the satellite and cable directive, for example, the resale right, these are very subject matter specific laws. Whereas a harmonized or horizontal um, directive applies across all different types of copyright protected works. So text, images, uh, music, etc. This directive uh, that I've highlighted here, the Information Society Directive or InfoSoc Directive, applies horizontally across all different types of copyright protected works. And this is uh, the directive from 2019, which is going to be relevant, uh, more relevant for us as we enter into the debate of I AI. And uh, this is referred to as the Copyright in the Digital Single Market Directive, or the DSM Directive for short. 
Finally, we move into national law. And according to different national laws in the EU, different exceptions and limitations might exist to copyright protection and different interpretations of those exist existing exceptions and limitations may also uh, be involved. So we can consider that national copyright laws in the EU are harmonized to a certain extent, meaning that they are generally the same to a certain extent, but they are also quite fragmented. We ask questions whether or not we have the same level of protection in one member state versus another. Now the CJEU or the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union has worked to help harmonize further the interpretation of the law, but this is also a very incomplete uh, legal process. And why do we have exceptions to copyright? Well, we have exceptions to copyright because copyright law and copyright protection needs some kind of breathing space. A well-functioning system is a balance between the exclusive rights of authors and the interests of the public in accessing and enjoying creative works. So we have some internal mechanisms of uh, balancing rights, which are the rights that are outlined in the laws that we have. And external mechanisms mean uh, mechanisms such as fundamental rights law, which may play a part in understanding which protections we have in copyright. And uh, ideally, exceptions and limitations help to improve society. So, for example, exceptions may facilitate the use of copyrighted content in circumstances such as education and research. So perhaps we can benefit from an exception to copyright protection if we have the copyright protected material in an educational or research context. These exceptions and limitations are usually in a closed list of predefined uses in Europe. So in Europe, we have what's known as a closed list of exceptions and limitations. Whereas in the US, we have a broad fair use exception, uh, which I'll discuss. Uh, there are many exceptions and limitations that are defined in the EU, but the key ones are uh, the following here. And you can find them also in the Information Society Directive in Article 5.3. Now, I've spoken a little bit about fair use so far, but I do think that this is important for the audience to understand. So fair use, as it appears in US legislation, is a doctrine that permits the use of copyright protected material without having to require the permission from the copyright holder. It's a flexible test and very fact specific, meaning that one case may differ from the other in terms of how fair use uh, may be assessed. It can be raised as an affirmative defense against a claim of infringement. So for example, I can't claim before I am sued that this use is fair. I can say that I understand that this use is fair and I can try to convince the copyright holder that my use is fair, but this does not prevent the copyright holder from uh, suing you in court. And then it is up to you to take on the risk and to raise the fair use defense as you're being sued. So this is something that is very subtle, but also very important to understand. A fair use defense does not prevent you from being sued in court for copyright infringement. There you go. Uh, this is the statute, how it uh, looks in US law. And the flexible test involves these last four factors, the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the original copyright protected work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work, and the effect of the use on the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. So if you have any questions on the fair use legal provision specifically, I'll be very happy to answer it during the uh, question and answer session, as it's, it may seem a little bit uh, difficult to understand from this very brief overview, um, but just for you to understand the differences between the US system and the EU system. This US system that we're discussing here describes 
a case-by-case -case analysis of whether or not a use can be fair of an original copyright protected work. Uh, we will also, well, we can also speak about the public domain. So some works are considered uh, not under copyright protection. They are public domain works. And this is promoting free access to content. And, and um, this is a more open system that we can consider. Creative Commons, it refers to a group of licenses which can be adopted by the creator or rights holder to allow them to relinquish certain rights and say, well, I actually want this to be more freely available. I don't care about my right of reproduction, right of distribution, et cetera. I will relinquish some aspects of my copyright protection in order to license it for the benefit of the public good. And here are a few differences between a traditional copyright, a Creative Commons license, for example, and works that are completely in the public domain. And just to remember, works that are completely in the public domain cannot benefit from any uh, financial exchange. So if a work is in the public domain, it is already open and available to everyone and you cannot obtain any revenues from accessing or selling works that are already within the public domain. And uh, here's a useful uh, link for you. Um, this is to find different copyright laws per member state. And this is a service that's available through the EU IPO. So if you want to understand which copyright laws apply uh, between each member state, this could be a very useful link. And um, it's to help you understand which copyright laws apply in my member state. Okay, uh, so with that, um, I do want to uh, have the floor open for at least uh, five minutes, uh, five to 10 minutes of questions. Um, so uh, Jean-Francois, um, would you uh, take the opportunity to um, ask our participants for any questions? Yes, of course. Um, I think uh, Sandra has been monitoring questions, but I can't see many questions in the chat yet. Um, I ha we have one, we have one so far. Okay, go ahead, Sandra. Okay, great. Yes, uh, uh, we have a question regarding uh, images and copywriting images. Uh, 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 are they, can they be copyrighted as well? Do they fall under this category of what can be copyrighted? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so that's a great question. Copyright and images exist. Um, the original creator of the image would be the person who obtains the rights to the image that they've created. And this creator of an image, they can determine uh, what extent of rights they have in the image. So for example, if I create something and I like the image uh, very much, I could uh, license the use of the image so that I still maintain rights to the image, but I just give a license to someone to use it for their advertising campaign, for example, for a certain amount of time, let's say one month. And then after that advertising campaign has finished, all of the rights in that image will go back to me as the original rights holder. So there are different ways in which we can play around with the rights that we have uh, in different copyright protected works. But essentially, the rights will automatically vest in the creator. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I see you holding your hand up. Do you have any additional questions regarding this since you asked the question? Yeah, yeah, I, may, maybe I, I expressed myself incorrectly. It was because I saw on the chart that what's mm -hmm. not protected included uh, people and people's images. But I know oh. there is such a thing as, at, at least in Spain, there is the right of your own image. And exactly. so I don't know if that's protected by a different type of uh, law that is not considered copyright or how how would that work? Because it, at, at least in Spain, if you, you have your image taken, you have to give permission uh, yes. in order for it to be used by, by a third party. Yes, yeah, so that's that's exactly right, uh, Iris. So thanks for bringing that up. The uh, 
right of uh, one's personal image and the right of one's personal name, this is a personality right. This is different than an intellectual property right. So rights of personality include um, aspects of my person. So my uh, personal image, my name, et cetera. And the fact that you can't obtain, let's say a trademark on someone else's name, you can obtain a trademark for your own name, but uh, you can't obtain a trademark for someone else's name because this would violate uh, their rights to personality. Rights of personality are different than intellectual property rights, but rights of personality are becoming increasingly more important when we speak about um, deep fakes and um, AI generated um, images of people. And there, it's not an intellectual property right that comes into play, but actually uh, a right of personality and a right of um, their personhood. So um, it's a very good question. Um, Iris, I hope I answered it. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. I, I should mention that this was a question from our colleague Iris Permui, from who's currently the the chair of ATRAI, the the Spanish Association of Translation trans, uh, Audiovisual Translators, who sits on the AVT Council as well. Uh, yes, uh, Natasha, I see another uh, uh, question that keep coming up. Uh, another one about NTFs. Uh, the idea uh, uh, is to register everything on blockchain globally: arts, books, music. So. Uh, anything to add uh, about the NTFs? In oh, terms yes. Of copyright. So, yeah. Yeah, I think this is uh, NFTs. Um, I, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not uh, very well versed in NFTs, unfortunately. Um, so, I can't really comment on the usefulness um, of uh, NFTs uh, in relation to copyright and copyright protected works. Uh, I will say that some large organizations, uh, for example, WIPO, have been uh, researching as to the um, utility of non-fungible tokens or NFTs, which are vested in copyright protected works, and whether or not this can be useful for tracking works digitally as they are circulated. Uh, but these are two different um, legal regimes. So. Uh, NFTs or to obtain a non-fungible token in the creations that you have, these are not necessarily within the same umbrella. It's a whole different uh, legal system and has its own different uh, rules applied to it. If, um, Sandra, if I may, I've uh, spotted two questions that are quite crucial to our profession. Yeah. Uh, one is about uh, some of our clients who don't mention or who refuse to mention our names at the end of a subtitle list, for example, or a subtitle program, mm. or um, in dubbing as well. It, it it also happens. Can they be? Can we invoke the the Bern Convention or any piece of national legislation to mm. um, enforce that the the, the fact that they sh we should be mentioned? Well, this, so to give credit uh, to subtitling and dubbing, this is uh, something that um, is, uh, of course, important. As a subtitler and as someone who uh, might double work, you do have a level of copyright protection in the um, derivative work that you create. And I'll explain a little bit about derivative works in uh, the next few slides of part two. Uh, but essentially, uh, you do have uh, some rights in the work. So you have a copyright protection to a certain extent in the derivative work that you've created. And uh, with this derivative work, you may also have some moral rights attached. And one of the moral rights that are attached is the rights to be uh, recognized for your work or the rights to have your name associated with the work. Um, so there are some legal remedies and we don't have to look just at the um, Berne Convention, which is an international treaty, but we can also turn to national law and copyright protection, because even in the works that you create, which is a derivative work of the original, you do have a separate and distinct copyright in that work. 
Thank you. Uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, there is a different question here, but I think uh, it connects to, the, to this one. Um, here it is. I know uh, one large language service provider used to add author's credits at the end of subtitled works shown on Netflix, mm -hmm. but sent quarterly reminders not to mention any shows we worked on in our CV or on social media. Is this even legal once the work is available via streaming with the author's name at the end? So what would you say to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't give any legal advice, but from this uh from this issue that's been presented. Um, if it's already publicly available, then I, I think that it's possible for you to be able to um, cite the work, uh, but this relies on the contract that you've signed. So if you've signed a contract saying that you will never associate your name with the work, then you should abide by the contractual terms that you've signed to. Um, otherwise, uh, if you uh, don't have such uh, an agreement signed in the contract, then you should be free to be able to reference works that you've been uh, credited as a subtitler on. So it really depends on the uh, negotiation that you've had and the contract you've signed and the terms of that contract. Um, but yeah, otherwise, it should be free for you to cite all the works that you've worked on. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, do we still have some more time for questions? Uh, uh, hopefully, because there are still some coming up. Okay. Uh, uh, why uh, do you use word deri deri derivative? Um, we have a question here. Under Croatian law, AV translation is an original work of, uh, of art. So mm -hmm. uh, what would be derivative in this sense? So... Um... That is, I think both of that, both of those um, points are correct, actually. So um, as I mentioned, the work that is created, so let's say the, the subtitled work that is created by the subtitler, it is its own distinct work, but it is also a derivative work, meaning that it could not exist without the original work being in place. So the owner of the original work let's say uh, the creator or the producer of a movie, this producer has all of the rights within this movie and they want to uh, give permission to a subtitler to do the subtitling for the work. This is a permission or an authorization that's granted to prepare a derivative work. Now, this permission is given to prepare a derivative work, which is the subtitles and the subtitles themselves can have a copyright protection vested in it, but it is not to the same level as the original work itself. So for example, if the subtitles include that Harry Potter is um, a young boy with uh, short hair and glasses and with a lightning bolt on his head, as a subtitler, you wouldn't be able to claim copyright infringement if someone else writes Harry Potter is a young boy with uh, lightning bolt stricken on his head, but you can say something like uh, the uniqueness of the way in which I interpreted this sentence is, uh, is original enough, sufficient enough that I should gain copyright protection over this. You can understand then that the copyright that is granted in the uh, derivative work, so the subtitled work, this copyright is much narrower than the scope of the copyright of the original work. Um, so I hope that answers the question for now. I do have two slides on derivative works uh, that I can go into and I can further elaborate on the difference there. Okay, thank you, Natasha. So we can go on to the second part then. Okay, sorry, okay. there's just, sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry, there, Amanda. There was yeah, just there was just one question here that I found really really interesting, from yeah. uh, Aurelia. Uh, I have seen several translation contracts, including provisions saying the translator accepts not to defend uh, their moral rights later on. Mm. Like moral rights could not be stripped away from the author slash translator. So, mm. is this kind of provision legal in the EU? I'm sorry to, uh, but I. But that had to be covered. 
No, it, it's a it's a really great question, and thanks for asking it. So that type of um, stripping clause uh, within a contract is um, this this cannot be enforced. So if you have a moral rights that um, is uh, is given through national law that's recognized through national law, contractual law cannot override this to this extent to strip away the recognition of moral rights. So there would be grounds for contesting this type of contractual provision um, because there's no there's no legal basis for you to be stripped completely of moral rights through contract. Um, I see a question here from a CMO. Um, yeah. From a, rep a representative from a CMO. Uh, can translators have economic rights, sorry, just escape me, economic uh, rights uh, that are administered through collective society? Mm. Uh, I think this is possible, actually. Uh, I'm not uh, personally um, uh, aware of this, but I think that this is possible. Uh, once the uh, translator um, shows that they have uh, an original work that they've created, and that um, there is, of course, this caveat where the copyright protection does not extend to the entire extent as the original work, but actually to the extent of originality that occurs within this subtitled work. This could be a subtitled work that um, is recognized as protectable and therefore potentially subject to collective management. I'm not sure how this uh, may work personally, but if uh, the representative from the CMO could uh, elaborate further during the Q and A on this possibility, it would be it would be really great to to hear from them. Mirka, I think you have something to add here, right? Uh, yes, uh, just to uh, add to this question, uh, we've done uh, a research and also a survey within the ABTE, and. Uh, many countries, uh, in many countries, uh, translators, adapters, subtitlers are uh, represented by their CMO. CMO. This is the case in Slovakia, mm -hmm. Czech Republic, in many other countries, uh, because let's not forget, it's not only about subtitles, it's also the whole group of, you know, all the professions that, that uh, fall under the dubbing production, basically. So there's dubbing script writers, etc. So this is exactly the case. We are represented by our CMO. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this confirms. So thanks very much for the confirmation, Mirka. All right. Um, so with that, uh, I do want to continue here. Um, and we'll start with this topic of uh, derivative works and um, the rights of that. And that's something that I just added a few slides on uh, just earlier today, because I thought it might be interesting for the audience to understand a little bit further. Um, and, but so before we go into member state by member state perspectives of the recognition of audiovisual translator rights, I will just very briefly go through this idea of derivative works. And the right to prepare derivative works is a right that's vested in the original copyright holder. So um, if, for example, we're speaking about someone like JK Rowling, who is the author of the Harry Potter series, uh, this author, um, JK Rowling, she also has a bundle of rights uh, within her original work, which is the Harry Potter series, the Harry Potter book. And uh, with this uh, bundle of rights, she has the right to prepare derivative works. The right to prepare derivative works could mean that it's her right to create a sequel. So to write uh, the second part of the series, she has the exclusive right to do so. This also means the right to prepare something uh, like a translation, an arrangement from an original work, et cetera. So the rights to prepare a translation is already exclusively vested within the original rights owner. So let's say, for example, JK Rowling. 
Now, J.K. Rowling wants there to be a Broadway adaptation of Harry Potter, and she wants it to be Harry Potter the musical. Someone approaches her and says, well, I'm a producer of Broadway musicals. Uh, I would like to produce uh, this work for you. She can license then the rights to prepare a derivative work to this producer of uh, the Broadway show. And so the producer of the Broadway show can create costumes, um, original sets, etc., all elements that are not part of this original book. And in these extra elements, in these added elements, so the stage design, the costumes, etc., it's there that the producer of this uh, new work can have a separate and distinct copyright protection. So you can see that there is the existence of a, an original work, Harry Potter, the book series. There is also another work that's produced, a Broadway show based on Harry Potter. There are original elements that the producer of the Broadway show cannot claim as uh, copyright protectable uh, by himself. So the character of Harry Potter, that is intellectual property that still belongs to J.K. Rowling. However, the intellectual property that he creates, the costumes, the sound design, the lighting, etc., all of these elements put together, this is what the producer of the new work can benefit from. So you can see that there are different sets of rights there. Um, the derivative work right is also referred to as the adaptation right. So if you see um, adaptation anywhere, you know that a derivative work has been prepared. And uh, without this original authorization, so without JK Rowling telling the Broadway producer, yes, you can use my source material in order to uh, create this new derivative work, the derivative work without this authorization could be considered copyright infringement because it's taking elements of the original protected work without the authorization of the original author. So a new copyright in derivative works is said to take place. And this was a point that was mentioned uh, just earlier. So under the law, a derivative work can obtain a very small protection in copyright. This copyright is smaller in scope than the original work on the derivative work on which the derivative work was based. Uh, however, there are some subtle uh, copyrightable elements in the derivative work, and these can be picked out due to the originality that exists in the derivative work. So in the uh, subtitling context, for example, or in the translation context, if there is a unique and special or poetic way of translating something that doesn't necessarily relate to the word for word uh, translation, the uniqueness of this interpretation can be considered original enough to have its own protection. However, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to uh, provide proof that this is sufficiently original in comparison to the original work. So uh, that's why it's uh, there is a copyright that can exist in the derivative work that you create. However, this copyright is much narrower in scope than the copyright that's available for the original work on which the derivative work has been based. So uh, hopefully that clears it up a little bit more. Um, I will continue, but uh, before I do that, there are there is a place to um, entertain some member state by member state perspectives. And we do have some interventions uh, that were planned regarding the status of national law for audiovisual translators' rights uh, from representatives from three different jurisdictions, Germany, Portugal, and France. So I did want to give the floor to um, these colleagues to explain a little bit what the status of recognition of audiovisual translators' rights are between these different member states. So we'll have the situation in Germany with Bettina Art. Thank you, Bettina. Yes, thank you, Jean-Francois, and thank you, Natasha, first of all, uh, for your 
description of uh, authors' rights. Um, first of all, I would like to say that um, as you talked about derivative um, works, that in Germany, translations are generally considered um, a creative work in itself. So um, it doesn't have to be, um, let's say, um, proven that there is a, a certain amount of um, creativity. Um, according to German copyright law, um, and I quote, translations and other adaptations. So translations are summed up under adaptation. Um, are personal intellectual creations uh, of the adapter and are protected as independent works. So they have copyrightability in their own right. Um, and translators uh, are entitled to receive royalties from our collective society or CMO, uh, VG Wort, which is uh, responsible for all um, kinds of literature texts and um, other um, related professions. And uh, the same goes for audiovisual translators, such as subtitlers, dubbing translators, also um, dubbing script writers. But we um, at the AVU, the, the German Association for Audiovisual Translators, we only represent the dubbing translators. Uh, it also goes for voiceover translators, movie script translators, and audio description writers who um, write for a blind audience. Um, that means, so So I'm um, highlighting or presenting the situation of authors' rights in Germany um, against the backdrop of how uh, the CMOs are, are dealing with us or are distributing royalties to um, our members. Um, 32% of the sum total of the royalties for a movie, documentary, etc. are allocated for its German version and are divided between the various AVT crafts. Um, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing and video game localizers do not receive royalties, but for two very different reasons. Um, Natasha talked about uh, the originality of, of a work, and um, here it's considered that the work of SDH subtitlers um, is not original enough or the threshold of um, originality is not high enough to uh, constitute a claim to royalties since uh, SDH subtitles consist uh, of a shortened version of either the original German dialogue or the dubbed film version. And um, so it uh, does not contain a lot of personal creation. On the other hand, um, this is not a decision by our CMO that is cut in stone. Um, there is the possibility for members to uh, bring in a motion and um, claim a change of um, the distribution scheme. And um, if there are enough members to vote for it, there might be a change. The problem is that, um, of course, most the, the majority of all the members of the CMO have to agree. And since there are very different um, crafts or professions within um, the membership, um, they consider the others who, who also want to participate in the royalties and the distribution of money to, um, yeah, they are afraid that they take away their money and that uh, we have less money um, all in all. So um, that was for the, the SDH um, subtitles. And the reason why video game localizers don't receive loyalt uh, royalties, sorry, um, has a different reason. Um, and I would like to explain the legal basis for German copyright royalties um, also in opposition to the French system, um, which Jean-Francois is going to explain later on. And um, the fact is that um, royalties for um, translation in, in Germany distributed 
distributed by the CMOs um, depend on secondary publication rights and not, as for example in France, on primary publication rights. That means that uh, it's not enough that uh, a film or a subtitled version or a dubbed version uh, is being broadcasted or screened. Um, there has to be the possibility of reproduction. And um, in other words, the possibility to copy the work in question and to create a private copy. Uh, for example, as uh, we used to do in the past, um, a TV show or a movie um, can be, could be recorded from TV on a VCR or video cassette recorder or also on DVD recorders. And in order to compensate the rights holders for potential copyright breaches resulting from such copying or storing, uh, a so-called flat rate or flat fee for device manufacturers has been established. That means that um, Manufacturers of copying, recording, and storing devices have to pay a certain amount of money for every device and a storing medium. And um, this goes all into the pot, the general royalty pot, so to speak. Um, the other thing is um, that we have been trying to, to get our CMO to accept or to distribute royalties for streaming platforms as well, since this has been becoming predominant and uh, DVD rentals that uh, brought especially uh, royalties for subtitles in the past, it's not, not really existing anymore. The problem here is the same as with uh, uh, video game localizers. Um, you might say that um, downloading a movie or another piece of work, a subtitled or a dubbed version of a film, uh, constitutes also a kind of private copy or should um, qualify for the flat fee for device manufacturers. But there has been a legal uncertainty and certainly also reluctance um, on the part of the manufacturers to uh, contribute because um, it has been said that uh, the downloading of movies on smartphones from a streaming platform is considered um, as part of a subscription license. And as soon as your account with a streaming platform is terminated, you are no longer able to access the film or the movie. And so it doesn't qualify as a private copy. Um, Excuse this... me, Bet Bettina, you have uh, about one minute left. Okay, I'll be quick. <laughs> um. The same goes for the video game localizers, because the use of video game platforms also relies on license contracts. And when you download a game, um, it henceforth doesn't qualify as a private copy, copy either. So um, this is a sort of problem because we feel that this work should also be remunerated. Um, but uh, we have a task force in the administrative board at our CMO, and they are trying to work out the issues or find a solution for that. But unfortunately, they haven't been su successful as yet. Okay, that's the situation in Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bettina. Now we'll hear about the situation in Portugal with Susana Loreiro. Susana. Hi. Yeah. Let me just do this. Okay, so in Portugal, situation is very different from from Germany. Um, so legislation wise, we we are we've signed the Bern Convention, and we have um, uh, uh, our legislation includes uh, translation since the eighties at least. So our legislation secures this, but the reality is is not like this. Uh, so um, in the in the uh, in 1980s um, there was only one public station which which is RTP um, and uh, RTP uh, used to pay royalties to the AV translators at the time and then sometime around late 80s early 90s um, they changed their contracts and stopped paying royalties. Um, what happened was that. Uh, 
whoever opposed this change, however, didn't sign the new contract, just didn't receive any work anymore. And uh, what happened was that most translators simply signed the contract and, and didn't fight this in any way. Um, and, and since then, since the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, no EV translators have received royalties that we're aware of, at least not in the cinema, not in television, uh, obviously not in streaming. Um, and uh, what we, we sign nowadays, I think Natasha is going to speak about this uh, in a bit, uh, is uh, we sign buyout contracts. So we sign contracts to just say we have no rights and we waive everything including moral wise, like some people were saying in the in the comments. Uh, and uh, we just we just waive everything. Um, and this uh, this isn't uh, this is just just in uh, in uh, audiovisual translation in even in literal translation. Uh, I tried asking a co some colleagues that I know and I, I haven't found a single sing literary translator that receives royalties. So this is um, something that is not very specific to the AB field. It's it's uh, it's it, it's um, it affects the translation uh, profession as a whole in Portugal. Um, we do have a CMO uh, which is called SPA, uh, and it's uh, an older CMO, and they supposedly <laughs> uh, cover uh, translators. But they're not very accessible, and uh, I don't know any translators that are registered there. So it's um, it, it, we, even the CMO that we have is not very approachable. So even if we wanted to uh, start a conversation, uh, it, it, we don't have um, someone to knock on uh, a door to knock on. You know, we have, but they're not opening it. Uh, so it's very hard for us to to do something about this at the moment. Um, also because there is um, a, a lack of, of, of literacy, of translators' literacy on authors' rights right now. Uh, most translators that you ask, not just uh, younger translators, but translators with maybe 20 years of experience, and most of them won't know that translators used to receive royalties, uh, and they just assume that uh, they waive everything and that it's, it's the way everything works. Um, so we have, um, it's kind of like we have like a, uh, a low self-esteem uh, here um, and the, the lack of literacy that kind of prevents us from from fighting for our rights uh, because we don't even know we, we could have them. Um, and what we're doing right now uh, in ATAV to, to try to at least um, change this, um, uh, to, to fight this lack of literacy, uh, we are going to have a, a workshop in April uh, an, an author's rights workshop, but like a, a national one with a, a national lawyer and see uh, how it works because um, uh, national law can, can depend, uh, as, as you can see. Um, and uh, uh, so the first steps right now is, is this, is to uh, try to, to uh, give uh, translators, Portuguese translators, um, more literacy on this topic so we can do something about it. But right now, if we don't know that we have these rights, we can fight for them. So in Portugal, it's it, it's a horrible situation. <laughs> it's very different from Germany. It's very different from Spain, as you're going to hear. Um, and it's, 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 it's curious how Europe should be regulated by the Bern Convention. And we have, you, we should have some um, consistency. And the reality is that it doesn't exist. And uh, I, I'm speaking in the middle because now you're going to hear from, from France and it's going to be better. So it's like kind of good example, really bad example, and then a good example. <laughs> and I think it's that's it for, for Portugal. Thank you very much, Susanna. So I have the, uh, the, the hard task of telling what the French situation is. <laughs> Um, obviously, well, obviously, it shouldn't be that obvious, but in our conversations within AVTE or with other colleagues in general, um, it appears that translators living and working in France are often perceived um, in, in other countries as enjoying a privilege status. However, it's not a privilege. It's the result of historic and collective fights going back to the 18th century. Um, because this is when the, the legal notion of author's rights first appeared in France and at that time, when theatre directors were making money out of plays, 
whose playwrights never received fees beyond the money they got paid up front, no matter how many times their works were produced on stage. So it, it started with people like Beaumarchais, um, and he was the one who founded the first author uh, society. Um, since the late 50s, a French law on authors' rights also includes all translators, whether they're translators working in the publishing sector or the audiovisual, the film and then audiovisual sectors, because translators are the authors of works of the mind, oeuvre de l'esprit, as, as we say in French. So that includes subtitled and dubbed films, series and documentaries, screenplay translation, um, and the issue of game translation is a bit tricky. Uh, in our association, we welcome um, people who work in video game translation as well as audio description and SDH. Uh, but these are a little bit more trickier, um, a little yeah, a little trickier areas, which I won't go into details now. We have two CMOs, uh, collective management organizations. Um, one is deals with fiction works, it's called SASEM, and the other one is uh, called SCAM, S-C-A-M, uh, dealing with documentaries, uh, meaning subtitled and or dubbed or voiceover uh, documentaries. But CMOs only deal with the royalties produced by the commercial exploitation of our translations. Um, so our income is twofold. Uh, first, we get paid for the creative work we did upon delivery of the work of the translation. And uh, the second part is when we get the royalties collected by CMOs after our subtitles, top dialogues, et cetera, um, were commercially exploited in film theaters, TV, DVDs, VOD, uh, the usual um, channel of broadcast we, we, know, we now know. The glitch is that we rarely have contracts, and that's a, a major point because it can be a problem to assert rights. Um, and also, uh, it's, it should be, um, in my view, it should be important to have contracts because then uh, we would be able to specify what comes under author, uh, author's rights and what doesn't. Um, for example, in the audiovisual sector, we are increasingly asked to perform technical tasks, which used to be done by in-house staff in subtitling companies, or dubbing studios. According to French law, these tasks should be paid as salaries or invoiced separately from the actual translation. But if we don't have contracts clearly um, defining these tasks, then there's a shady area. Uh, there's also the, the special case of screenplay translation, which I won't go too much into details now, but basically uh, it happens that more and more often um, dialogue which we uh, screenplay, uh, sorry, screenplay which we translate include obviously dialogue which is then used, which can be used uh, for the end film um, for some reason or other from the, the production uh, setup that was achieved. And um, sometimes we don't know about this, whereas uh, we should be considered as co-author of the dialogue, not of the original idea and the original screenplay. And this is probably a deri derivative right, uh, I assume, but this should be recognized as well. Um, as in other countries, some of our colleagues working for streaming platforms or through so-called vendors or language service providers are offered no contracts at all or they might be offered buyout contracts um, by, by which they get paid once and for all, but they, they sort of waive any rights they could have, which is a return to the situation of the, 19, of the 18th century playwrights, basically. Um, so I know that uh, Nat Natasha will go into buyout contracts uh, a little in a few minutes, um, but I think it, it has to be... Um, highlighted. So ATA and other authors' unions, uh, although we're not a union, are doing their best to um, have our rights recognized and protected and enforced, even though uh, we might be considered as, as very well protected compared to other countries. Thank you.
Great. Um, so thanks so much for um, these colleagues uh, taking their time to compile these experiences from different uh, member states. And you can see that the situation is, is quite drastically different between uh, each member state. Um, and I think it's important to highlight that uh, not only in this area, but also many other areas of copyright law, it's quite um, is quite fragmented uh, through the um, through the EU itself and also internationally. So it's very important to specify which uh, jurisdictions will preside over the agreements that you have, especially if those agreements involve a cross border um, element. And uh, through specifying which law may apply, hopefully this can help to anticipate some issues that may occur down the road. Um, so yes, I did want to continue uh, the presentation by speaking a little bit about buyouts. So we did speak quite a bit about uh, derivative works. And again, if you have any other questions on the differences between uh, the preparation of derivative works and the recognition of a separate and distinct copyright in the work that is created, uh, we can have a fuller discussion uh, during the end q and I want to leave at least 15 minutes uh, for that. And um, so let's go right into this issue of buyout. So what is the term buyout and what is a buyout clause? So a buyout contract or a buyout clause is a complete transfer of rights, usually in exchange for an upfront lump sum fee or lump sum payment. So this means that it fully transfers all of the rights in the work that's produced to whoever the beneficiary is. And it prevents the creator or the rights holder from receiving additional royalties as the work is exploited. So this is a one-time upfront payment of a fee and usually if it is a buyout contract or a buyout clause, this also entails that any future royalties that could be received from future exploitations of the work will also be relinquished. So in exchange for this lump sum payment, we will then give you, we will then uh, forbid you from obtaining any additional royalties as this work is being circulated on the market. Uh, there is a legal doctrine in place in the U.S. that is quite important for understanding why the situation with buyout contracts and buyout clauses is so um, uh, restrictive for rights owners. And this is the concept in the U.S. of a work made for hire or a work for hire contract. I will explain the difference between the US system and the EU system in the following slides, but for now, let's just consider the US system. So in the US, there's a concept of work for hire. And this concept means that there is a legal assumption that the copyright and related rights in the work that's commissioned is automatically assigned to the producer during the course of its creation usually for a single or one-time fee. So most com this is most common in US produced films and audiovisual programs. So if I enter into an agreement to create a work, all of the rights that will be vested in this creative work is automatically assigned to the producer, whoever it is. Uh, a full buyout is actually rare, so in, practice, a full complete buyout or a full complete work for hire um, made contract is um, sometimes it's not as uh, widespread as uh, usual, as usually um, considered. Uh, so full buyouts are rare as creators may still have a right to collect, for example, a writer's share uh, within that contract. And this would um, ameliorates the idea of there being a complete uh, buyout of rights. However, full buyouts still exist um, uh, in different uh, contractual agreements. And this concept of work for hire is especially difficult for creators because it involves an automatic uh, assumption that the work and its rights are automatically vested in a producer. 
This is different in Europe because the idea or concept of a work for hire does not exist. And the consequence is that creators are presumed to own the intellectual property of their works. And then after the work is created, this intellectual property can then be transferred from the creator to the work. So essentially, there is no automatic assumption that the intellectual property is vested in a work as is in the US, but in Europe, there must be a transfer of rights to occur to understand that the property rights have been vested somewhere else. So moral rights may still be recognized in works in Europe as these rights cannot be negotiated away. So we've uh, talked a little bit before about contracts that you may find, which include uh, words such, such as I waive all moral rights uh, that may um, be in the work, or I waive all claim to moral rights that may be in the work that I, that I provide. And this type of uh, clause is usually not enforceable. Why is it not enforceable? Because a moral right is not an economic right. A moral right cannot be exchanged uh, for an economic or financial value. They are rights that will exist, uh, that exist with the creator that cannot be um, negotiated away. And these include these um, uh, droits d'auteur and also these patrimonial rights that we discussed uh, earlier. Um, so the difficulty here is recognizing a moral right in a jurisdiction such as the US. So in the US, there is not as robust of a moral rights recognition and moral rights system. And therefore, if you have a contract that falls within the jurisdiction of the US, it's much more difficult to enforce a moral right in the US under US law. Because in the US, moral rights they are recognized, but to an extremely minimal extent in comparison to the moral rights that are present in many member states which are recognized in Europe. So if uh, you enter into a contract agreement with the US company and they insist that uh, you waive all uh, moral rights associated with the work, what you're left with is moral rights that are uh, much less um, less forceful in the US as they are in Europe. And this is the, this is the challenge of um, enforcing rights in the US versus in the EU. In the EU, under EU law and under EU contractual law, it, this also depends on each member state, but in general, the protections for creators are much stronger uh, than in uh, the US. So when you're in the situation of negotiating fair terms uh, for any contractual agreement, there are some um, elements of language that you can look for, which will indicate to you that this may not be a fair uh, negotiating term. And I might want to suggest a change uh, to the contract. So it, these are um, just examples that I've taken, uh, not necessarily from the um, audiovisual translation context, but sometimes this occurs in um, musical agreements where uh, there is an agreement between a composer and a producer of a song. Um, so composer hereby irrevocably, exclusively, and absolutely assigns all rights, so copyrights, right under copyright and otherwise, whether now or here and after known, this is an extremely broad contractual provision that you might see uh, in a contract. And this indicates to you that a buyout is going to take place or that the negotiation will be that there is going to be a complete taking of rights underneath this contract. And this is the type of uh, contractual provision that you might want to flag as problematic um, if you're in the position of signing an agreement. Um, another terminology that you might be able to see hereby assigns in perpetuity all rights. So this is also quite broad and it is something that uh, goes even against uh, typical copyright law. So of course, copyright protection only extends to the life of the author uh, plus 70 years, depending on the jurisdiction and assigns in perpetuity, the rights won't exist in perpetuity. So 
Uh, this type of clause, it is overly broad, even broader uh, than what is accepted under recognized uh, legislation. There's also um, this uh, clause here, subject to payment under this agreement, all current and future revenues shall be vested in X, Y, and Z. So all current and future revenues shall be vested. That means that all of the rights that you will have in any royalties that the work will receive over time, you renounce these royalties for the future. So these are um, some uh, terms that you might see in an unfair contractual uh, buyout agreements that you can indicate and you can flag as something that you need to negotiate further. And of course, uh, there are some existing legal safeguards in place in different member states, which can protect you against unfair contractual buyout practices. So um, in some member states, for example, in France, Italy, and Spain, the law does require that remuneration for creators much, must be proportional to the income derived from the exploitation of their works. And if you enter into an agreement where the remuneration is extremely low in exchange for the, um, the product and service that you've provided, then there are some safeguards in place uh, to prevent this from being the case in which you can raise, um, uh, raise against uh, the person who you've entered into the contract with. In the Copyright in the Digital Single Market Directive, this was passed in 2019, and now all of the member states must implement it within their national legislation. And in this directive, there's a provision on fair and equitable remuneration in contract. This is between Articles 18 to Articles 21 of the Copyright in the Digital Single Market Directive. And each member state is obligated to implement these provisions, uh, promoting fair and equitable remuneration in uh, contractual agreements between creators. And these elements should be enforced in all of the contracts that are applied within this domain. So this is a nice um, innovation in uh, national law that uh, should be reliable for creators to uh, show that they must be paid uh, fairly and equitably. Uh, in Germany and the Netherlands, there are uh, specific pieces of legislation which prohibit uh, co complete buyout practices. And they provide for an overriding mandatory rule prohibiting or limiting the use of full copyright buyout contracts. So uh, these in these jurisdictions, there's more explicit law against this and something that's a little more reliable for uh, creators to prevent them from entering into an unfair uh, buyout situation. Um, so we don't have a lot of time left, but I did want to touch on some of these uh, more modern topics. And um, I will skip through the, uh, the next few slides and really focus on artificial intelligence because I think this is a hot topic um, in, the, in this field that's worth discussing and worth having a discussion over um, now. Um, so copyright, of course, is a legal regime that has a pacing problem, meaning that copyright is always catching up to new technology. So new technology is introduced, and then copyright law must play this catch-up game to then encompass the new use or the new technology that's put in place. Why is this a problem? Well, it's because it's very difficult to change the law, and citizens must also agree that uh, the, there is a change that needs to be put into place. So there has to be some level of public awareness of the issue before law can then uh, be passed in order to ameliorate this type of issue. Uh, this is just kind of uh, to demonstrate the uh, level of uh, technological change between uh, 1998 and 2001 when the Information Society Directive uh, was uh, passed in Europe. Uh, and 1998 when the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or DMCA was passed in the US. So there was an enormous technological change between the two. 
And um, now we have a completely different technological landscape than we did uh, during the time when this major legislation was passed in the late 90s and early 2000s. So now I wanted to discuss a little bit the challenges of AI. And at CZAC, uh, we are monitoring very closely the passage of the EU AI Act. So the EU AI Act will uh, come into force uh, within the next few years. Now it's still um, passing through uh, the legislative bodies of the European Union, but the final text has been agreed on so far. There are many issues that exist with artificial intelligence from a copyright perspective. One side deals with all of the issues where copyright protected works are being fed into an AI in order to train that AI to produce outputs. Another set of issues relates to the copyrightability of the outputs. So can there be a copyright that exists if I use a generative AI to create something? This is still an unresolved legal issue and it creates a whole host of new legal problems. Now, for our purposes, um, I will just introduce to you the uh, EU AI Act and two parts of the act that relates to copyrights and related rights protection. So the EU AI Act is not subject matter specific. It doesn't specifically deal with intellectual property law, but it has a few different provisions that are incorporated into the act, which may be beneficial for copyright rights holders and intellectual property rights holders. So for example, there are elements within this act that include respect for copyright law. So the providers of general purpose AI um, models, so general purpose AI models such as OpenAI must include policies to respect copyright. Uh, this includes an opting out uh, for text and data mining purposes. So if I uh, understand and I'm aware that my works are being used to train an AI model, I must be able to successfully opt out of the AI's use of my work as trading material. And this is something that may be supported in the future through this EU AI Act. There is also a very important provision, uh, which includes that the EU AI Act will have some level of extraterritorial effect. That means that irrespective of the jurisdiction of the training of an AI model, the rules of the EU AI Act should be abided by, even if the jurisdiction of the AI model is in the US, for example. So some provisions will help to further respect uh, copyright laws, and hopefully in the future will help to bolster the position of creators. There are also important measures regarding transparency. So providers of general purpose AI models are required to draw up and make publicly available a sufficiently detailed summary of content, which should be used for uh, training. And this template will be provided by a brand new EU AI office. So if I am an AI operator, I will now be required under the EU AI Act to make available a detailed summary of all of the works that I've used uh, in order to train the AI model. And here's my final slide, and these are some thoughts for the future. So uh, for the future, we need to understand how to create uh, better licensing around the use of works as training data for AI. And this is one of the uh, main current uh, goals of CZAC is to encourage discussions over how work should be licensed, uh, under what terms, under what circumstances, how can licenses be made uh, available, how can they be negotiated fairly, et cetera. Um, we also need to consider perhaps mandatory provisions for remuneration where works have been used to train AI. And maybe services have to adapt uh, to um, the change of technology. So we need to uh, begin to ask questions such as what is unique to the profession and for this uh, 
For this uh, workshop's example, what is unique to the profession of audiovisual translation? How can the community capitalize on its advantages? And how can we um, make it clear that AI might be a tool, but audiovisual translation or this um, audiovisual translation work is should be regarded as an inclusive service. So maybe in the future, uh, in the very recent future, we'll have to consider how to leverage our positions differently as uh, copyright rights holders against uh, the practices of AI uh, operators. And uh, with that, uh, thanks very much for your attention. I saw that very many participants were still sticking to the very end. Um, I did want to open the floor for questions. And I think Jean-Francois, you might also have um, some questions uh, of your own to ask, but um, I'll be available for uh, the next few minutes until uh, 4 p.m. for anyone to uh, go ahead and ask any question they might have. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Natasha, for this very comprehensive um, coverage of the of the subject. Um, I would like to draw our audience's attention to a number of recent statements from professional organizations about generative AI, um, such as the Society of Audiovisual Authors, SAA, which has um, uh, released quite a, a comprehensive um, statement on the subject last October. AVTE is about to release a statement itself in, in the next few weeks. Um, and there's there's also a French collective uh, called Enchères et Enos, uh, which is doing a lot on this, on creating awareness about the uh, also the dangers of um, AI. As you said, Natasha, AI should be a tool. The problem is that generative AI is more than a tool. And audiovisual translation is also more than a service, if I may. Uh, it's a creative activity, and that's the whole point of our of our discussion today. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so maybe I'll, um, uh, Sandra, you can take over and perhaps um, tell us which questions should be answered. Yes, in, we have limited um... time. We have. Yeah, in the little bit of time that we have, uh, we have some questions left over from the first part of the presentation that might uh, be uh, interesting to uh, clarify. Additionally, uh, there seems to be um, uh, uh, some uh, concerns about what is considered to be public domain. Uh, Anna is asking, uh, uh, she's publishing text on her G German webs websites uh, and uh, she gets royalties for that. So uh, can this be seen as copyrighted? And uh, is scraping such content uh, legal at all? Mm, okay, so uh, there are a few facets to that question. So making uh, something available on a website, so for example, a public website, this isn't um, putting it in the public domain. So you can still have copyright protection over something, even if you put it on a website and you host it on a website, you can still um, have your copyright protection vested in something like this. If, um, if a service scrapes the information from this website, it's not necessarily considered a copyright infringement, but you do have the ability as the rights holder, as the proprietor of that information to opt out of the scraping of the data from this, uh, uh, from a data scraper. And the way that you can do this is a very technical way. So there is a technical solution called um, robots.txt or a robots file, which you can integrate within your website. I don't, I'm not sure of the technical details of this, um, but the way to prevent a web scraper from taking the data from a website that you uh, have that you don't want uh, to be scraped is to integrate this robots.txt into your website. And this would indicate to the web scraper that it prevents um, this uh, activity from occurring. Uh, I did see a comment that was uh, just flashed through that it's not 100% effective in preventing this from happening. And of course, this is uh, a challenge that needs to be addressed within the um, EU AI Act, for example. So now, 
uh, in this uh, gray area where there's no legal provisions in place which are specifically obligating uh, AI operators to respect an opt out. Now, uh, there will be um, some reinforcement of respecting uh, authors uh, rights and uh, authors opt out uh, from this, uh, which will be integrated into the EU AI Act. So we'll see if this is going to be effective in helping to bolster enforcement in this regard. Okay. Um Regarding to this public domain issue, uh, some re researchers are concerned how much uh, of this uh, uh, can they use uh, in their work. Uh, for example, if uh, for example, if they can use stills, uh, uh, screenshots, green screens, and uh, stuff like that, uh, can they uh, are they safe to use that in terms of copyright? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, when it comes to research work for academia. Uh, yeah, so um, I would say that uh, there are some exceptions that are available for research purposes, but these should be quite limited. So you would have to justify that by any other means, it would be difficult or impractical or impossible for you to um, obtain the information otherwise. And uh, if somebody tells you, so if someone on the outside tells you to cease and desist your use of their work for this purpose, then you would have to uh, try your best to respect the cease and desist or then rely on the availability of an exception for research purposes. So even this type of activity, it should be taken at your risk. And you should understand that um, this needs to be a justified activity and be prepared to justify the reasons why um, you want to benefit from an exception. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are still some questions regarding the uh, the jurisdictions, actually. One uh, is which national law applies to a given work, uh, uh, the country uh, that the creators work in or something else, for example? Okay, this is a very, this is a very tricky one. So mm -hmm. um, the uh, applicable law would uh, be determined uh, differently according to which, um, uh, like what uh, issue is at stake. Um, so the member state in which the um, audio translator is working in, uh, this could be applicable if it's uh, a right of the audiovisual translator himself that's at stake. Otherwise, if it's the um, if the act or if the infringing act occurs in another member state, then the law of that member state would um, take precedence. So for example, if there was a copyright infringement and it occurs in a different member state, but you are the original creator from uh, another member state, the place at which the infringement occurs, that is the legal jurisdiction in which you would look at the, the applicable law. Um, but this is a very general rule. And of course, it's very fact specific. Uh, so from the from the question, uh, this is the best answer I could give. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, you were talking about the uh, uh, legal safeguards uh, that exist in the EU, uh, but do they apply, uh, apply even if contract jurisdiction is in the US? Mm -hmm. Whether, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is also another um, complex question. It deals with um, this cross-border issue of which uh, jurisdictions law might apply. And if uh, the content is um, accessed and used and the destination is within the US, the uh, applicable law would be would be the US jurisdiction and US law. But there, um, there can be some uh, changes to this. If, for example, you have a contract and both parties agree that the applicable law should be EU law. And by contract, you say, well, um, we've, we agree that the law that should apply is the law of Germany, for example, and any conflict shall be resolved under the law of Germany. Then it is very explicit that the law of Germany and the law of EU member states shall apply. Um, so that's why it's also important to specify this in contracts, as we've mentioned many times already, um, because this can help to resolve a legal issue where we have differences in um, uh, cross-border uh, legislation and you want to be able to benefit fully from uh, the applicable law in the EU, let's say. 
-hmm. Okay. Uh, do we still have a time? I think this one is very interesting and it concerns the interpreters, but uh, it's an interesting uh, issue. Uh, do I have an IP concerning my voice where there is a recording of my rendition? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there is not an IP per se, but what I would say applies is a personality right. And a personality right is different from an intellectual property right in that it protects elements of your own personality and identity and the sound of your voice, um, the characteristics of your voice. This is something that's protectable, but not under uh, an intellectual property right, but under uh, personality rights or right of personality. Okay. Yeah. So that's very interesting, yeah. Um, and do we still have time left for Another quick question. <laughs> Getting quite yeah, I, I see a lot of concerns in the in the chat, and yeah. you know, I am I am doing my best here to explain. Uh, I understand that the situation is very difficult for um, uh, audiovisual translators today. So I hope that this isn't uh, too disheartening, but and I hope it gives you more tools than than anything to understand what your rights are, to understand that a contract would be. Uh, preferable if you're able to get into a contractual agreement and that uh, you do have rights in the works that you produce, um, which should be something that you can rely on. I think if I may, I think the, the major issue which comes out of this discussion this afternoon is that is the one of contracts. I mean, yes. in the publishing sector, people usually have contracts, but they don't in the audiovisual sector. So that I assume that would be a, a major fight to impose uh, uh, the, the use of contracts um, uh, with our clients, whether they're intermediaries or end clients. This seems to be crucial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. And I'm sure it will be the topic of future discussion for the audiovisual translators group. So you do have an event coming up in uh, Barcelona. So maybe this would be great to have a panel just on this uh, issue. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, we'll have to finish now. Um, um, thank you very much for everyone who was online and who stayed until the end of this, um, of this um, webinar today. It's been really good, and it shows that there's a there's this is a common will and wish of people to know more about this issue. And the major thing to do is to act collectively, not stay on your own. But thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciated the time, and uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you'd like, it's uh, natasha.mangal at czac.org. Um, so thanks again for uh, all of your comments. And uh, I know I didn't get to all of them, but I really appreciate them. And if you have a further question, please don't hesitate to just reach out to me. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you.